Okay. Uh, welcome to Double Day Didn't Do It, a history of baseball presented by Tom Keller. My name is Patrick from Stores Library and I will be facilitating uh, this evening. This program is supported in part by a grant from the Longmeadow Cultural Council, a local agency which is supported by the Mass Cultural Council, a state agency. Also in conjunction with the Longmeadow Historical Society whose president Al McKee and board members Betsy McKee we have here with us tonight. So wave over there. Over there. Um, uh, popular legend has it that Abner Doubleday invented and codified the rules of the game of baseball in his native Cooperstown, New York in 1839. That bit of trivia, however, has little basis in truth. The game has deep roots and was well known long before Doubleday was even born. We'll trace these roots and the evolution of the game from child's play to the very beginning of professional baseball, as well as how, double, how the Doubleday myth came to be and why it remains fixed in the popular mind. Joining us today is Tom Keller uh, to talk about the origins of the national pastime. Take it away, Tom. Thanks very much for having me, everybody. Really appreciate it. Um, let me get to the proper share screen. Too many screens open. There we go. And we'll do the slideshow and then we'll stop fooling around with this. From the beginning. In the beginning was the word. There we go. Okay, so um, as Patrick Patrick said, um, we're going to talk about some myths here. Uh, the decade of the 1830s saw a lot of inventions. Of course, uh, McCormick's Reaper in 1834 and uh, the electric motor in 1834 as well. Some say the principle was first demonstrated in 1831 with the electromagnet. Um, Samuel Morse's telegraph was patented in 1837. He couldn't really do a large scale long distance demonstration until he got a big grant from Congress um, in the early 1840s. But nonetheless, he patented it in 1837. And of course, Louis Daguerre um, uh, invented photography in 1839. And uh, as we were saying, popular legend has it that um, Abner Doubleday invented and codified the rules of the game of baseball in his native Cooperstown in 1839. But that bit of historical trivia, however, has no basis in truth, um, not even a sliver. Nonetheless, baseball has, uh, has become, as Oliver Wendell Holmes declared, distinctly American. Um, poet Walt Whitman likewise declared it to be, quote, America's game, while another fan boasted that Muslims may have their Mecca, but Americans have Cooperstown. Well, long before the, quote, national pastime, end quote, by the early, uh, long called the national pastime by the early 20th century, the game was hailed as the exponent of, ex, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking well tonight, um, the exponent of American courage, confidence, and combativeness. Um, everybody loves triple alliterations. So here's another of American dash, discipline, and determination, pluck, spirit, and virality. Um, baseball, like America itself, was both quick and democratic, at least to an earlier age, not used to um, the internet and uh, flash videos. But anyway, um, American soldiers in World War II, of course, routinely used baseball trivia to distinguish a true American from an English speaking foreign spy. Today, baseball is both a pastime and a multi billion dollar business, an institution, and really an entity unto itself. It also remains among the most popular of the many sports avidly played and watched in the United States today. But the claim that it's all American, which is really behind the Abner Doubleday myth, um, is, I would say, beyond questionable. It's just plain false. I mean, look at the little medieval illustration below. Sure looks like baseball to me. Um, might be some other game, but sure looks like baseball. Anyway, um, the point is, is that, uh, um, like so much else uh, about America, um, it was imported. Um, even, even the indigenous people here, when the Europeans showed up, came over the Bering Straits. Um, anyhow, um, so, and, and, and the, base, the game of baseball has evolved through time. It continues to evolve today. Just witness um, the, the current uh, spread of the designated hitter from the um, junior league, the junior circuit, I should say, the American League, to, uh, to the National League now. Um, but baseball's roots go far back beyond the founding of the United States. Even though basic rules were not published until the 19th century, 
games were played with balls in ancient Egypt, China, and Greece. And at least as early as the 13th century, a game called club ball was played um, by teams of men and women in England. The, the, here's an illustration here, which I'll show you again later from an 1844 um, English book um, illustrating baseball. Well, the bases look a little high. They're more posts than bags, but still um, you can see the words on the screen that went with this little uh, woodcut. Anyhow, um, uh, even, um, the, the, I mean, anyway, the, 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 the Dutch played a game called Kotspiel. Um, they played stool ball while the Germans played another bat and ball game called Schlag ball. Now cricket evolved as a common game in both England and America. But by the 18th century, so had a simple children's game called baseball, originally spelled as two words. Um, 1844, excuse me, 1744, a little poem called Baseball appeared in, a, in an English children's book. The game, the ball once struck off, a wife, away flies the boy to the next designated post and then home with joy. Not the greatest poetry in the world, but certainly describes um, a game that resembles baseball to me. Um, and that little woodcut that I just showed you was accompanied to illustrate the, um, here, I'll go back. We don't have to watch Jane Austen yet. Um, so anyway, the, this little woodcut accommodated, accompanied that, uh, that, little, that little poem in 1744. Uh, London courtier, Lady Hervey, um, Mary LaPelle originally, uh, wrote in a letter dated November 14th, 1748, quote, uh, I mean, she wrote of, quote, baseball, a play all who are or have been schoolboys are acquainted with, when she was describing the activities of Frederick, then the Prince of Wales. Um, English lawyer William Bray wrote in his diary on Easter morning in 1755, quote, went to Stoke Church this morn after dinner, went to Miss Geel's party, Miss Geel's to play at baseball with her, the three Miss Whiteheads, Miss Billinghurst, Miss Molly Flutter, and Mr. Chandler, Mr. Ford, and H. Parsons, drank tea and stayed till eight, end quote. Um, even, even Jane Austen, I do hear, have her here for a reason, uh, around 1815 mentioned the game of baseball in her novel, Northanger Abbey. On the first page, among other things she wrote, uh, Mrs. Moreland was a very good woman and wished to see her children everything they ought to be, but her time was so much occupied in lying in and reaching the little ones that her elder, elder daughter, excuse me a second, I need to adjust something here. Anyway, um, that her elder daughters were inevitably left to shift for themselves, and it was not very wonderful that Catherine, who had by nature nothing heroic about her, should prefer cricket, baseball, riding on horseback, and running about the country at the age of 14 to books, or at least books of information, blah, 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 blah. We all know how Jane Austen liked books, being such an author. Um, but to move on from Jane Austen to this side of the Atlantic, um, ball games came to this side of the Atlantic with the first generations of English settlers with mixed degrees of acceptance. Uh, Governor Bradford in, in um, Plymouth Colony, of course, initially forbid ball playing in 17th century Plymouth, Massachusetts, while the Puritan leaders of Massachusetts Bay Colony, and they started in Boston, came to endorse um, ball playing as preferable recreation to gambling and drinking. Of course, gambling, drinking, and sports, including baseball, have sort of all reunited again. Um, but some groups, such as the Quakers, saw such play, or most play, as sinful wastes of time. Uh, Princeton College banned the sport of baseball in 1787 as, quote, low and unbecoming gentlemen students, inasmuch it is attended with great danger to the health, end quote. Many New Yorkers complained of the annoyance of ball playing in their fields and parks. In the town of Pittsfield, Massachusetts in 1791, that town banned playing ball within 80 yards of its new meeting house, of course, to protect the, the expensive glass and all the windows. And in 1816, Worcester was um, to the east, forbid the playing of the game in its streets as well. Now, all this disapproval seems to indicate to me a fair amount of ball playing must have gone on in early America for so many people to be complaining it, about it and banning it. 
Several positive examples of the game survive as well, though, or at least what may be the game. Um, Revolutionary War soldier George Ewing. Um, well, I'll get back to Longfellow in a minute. Um, sorry, I got a little out of order here. Um, Revolutionary War soldier George Ewing played bass at Valley Forge in April, in April 1778 and recorded that event in his diary on April 7th. Now, I don't know if bass was um, baseball or prisoner's bass, which is kind of like capture the flag, but half the word is there. You never know. Um, Colonel James Lee recalled playing baseball as a boy in New York around 1800. Shoemaker, Lewis Prentice, recalled that as a boy in Grafton, Massachusetts, in the 18 teens, the May holiday of Election Day, called Old Lection in his uh, reminiscences, typically included, quote, a game of ball in the afternoon, round ball, 16 on a side, with soft balls, S, um, a small S, I should say, and two words, so not the, the big ball we call today softball. Um, two New York children's books illustrated playing ball in the 1820s. Um, let me skip ahead here a little bit, I think. Oh, now my computer's frozen up. Come on, computer. Ooh. There we go. Um, in 1824, Bowdoin College student Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, that's where he was going. Yes, there he is, Longfellow, um, enthusiastically played and wrote that the game communicated such an impulse to our limbs and joints. There is nothing now heard of in our leisure hours but ball, ball, ball. I cannot prophesy with any degree of accuracy concerning the continuance of such rage for this play, but the effect is good. And since there has been a thoroughgoing reformation from inactivity and turpitude, who uses the good word turpitude anymore? I ask you. Anyway, that's just my commentary. Daniel Webster, um, the great orator, um, when he was a college student at Dartmouth, played ball um, at Harvard. Oliver Wendell Holmes, the class of 1829, likewise indulged in the game as did many students at Brown down in Providence, Rhode Island. New York politician Thurlow Weed recalled, quote, a baseball club numbering 50 members met every afternoon during the ball playing season in his native Rochester, New York, about 1825. The July 13th, 1825 edition of the Delhi, New York Gazette printed a challenge from nine New Jersey men to any team in Delaware County, New York, that cared to play them for the sum of $1 a game. In 1859, a man in Steuben County, New York, recalled that, quote, for 20 years, baseball has been a popular game wherever he had lived in New York, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. Quote, it is the game at our district schools during the intermission hours and often engaged in by youths of both sexes. It became the quite popular American game of baseball. But as I was saying with Valley Forge and the game of base, as Shakespeare said, what's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So it went by a lot of different names in both England and America. Um, in the West of England, it was one of the most favorite sports with bat and ball and also went by the name of rounders as baseball seems to have fallen out of favor there by the 1800s. In London, the game, or a very similar game, or a game that certainly could have evolved into it, was called feeder. And instead of teams, one boy was the feeder, we'd call a pitcher, who pitched to his playmates in turn until he could put a batter out, whereupon he became the batter, and the boy put out became the fe feeder. Um, I remember playing something like that when I was a kid and it was just my brother and I, and we couldn't get any other kids in the neighborhood to, to play ball with us. So that's kind of what we, we didn't call it feeder. We just called it baseball with two people. Anyway, Americans continued to call the game baseball. Again, two words usually, as well as goal ball, round ball, presumably from rounding the bases. I think round ball, except for footballs, most balls around and in one direction, footballs around. But again, that's my digression. Um, but Americans uh, also called it um, town ball, especially in Pennsylvania towns. Um, and, and towns, I think, are important because you really do need a concentration of population to play real baseball because you got teams. Um, my brother and I, you know, could play feeder. And then there's another small game that you can play, which is a few people called Old Cat. Um, but uh, some people even called it based ball, B-A-S-T-E, like basting a turkey. 
Um, some just called it ball and others referred to it as base. But without a national organization to dictate or mass media to disseminate rules as we have today and as they've had since the mid 1800s as it became more of an adult um, pastime than a children's game, the game differed slightly from one town to the next. Like pickup games today, the rules change from one game to another, depending on the number of players, the inclination of the players, and the condition of the field on which they had to, to use to be played. Um, again, like my youth, you didn't always have a baseball field to play on. But anyway, regardless of what one called it, um, baseball was almost certainly based on the old English game, child uh, schoolboys game of rounders. In fact, when Robin Carver described the game in his book of sports, published in Boston in 1834, he commented that, quote, this game is known under a variety of names. It is sometimes called round ball, but I believe that base or goal ball are the names generally adopted in our country, meaning um, the United States. Um, he then merely copied verbatim the rules for rounders printed a few years earlier in Englishman William Clark's the boy's own book. Uh, when the Providence firm of, um, there's a book from Robin Carver's Book of Sports, playing ball on Boston Common in 1834. There's the boy on the right with the bat and the boy on the left with the, the ball ready to feed. There's a boy obviously at the corner there of the pass, which is probably um, a base ready to run. He certainly looks ready to run. And there's Bullfinch's um, state house that's still there. Um, towering in the background. Anyhow, um, let's see. Uh, when the Providence firm of Corey and Daniels published their book, Boys and Girls Book of Sports in 1835, they, like Carver, also copied Clark's rules for rounders and headed the section base or goal ball, just as Carver had. While the name rounders may have been used now and again in 19th century America, Andrew H. Cahey of Erie, Pennsylvania recalled playing the game as a boy around 1840, but he, quote, had never heard of the game called Rounders. We'll get more to that later. Um, but there's that book of round, the, the, the rules for Rounders published in England in 1829. And except for the little preface I read before, the rules are copied verbatim, even the little diagram here when um, Carver and, um, and uh, um, Corey and Daniels published their books here in New England in the mid 1830s. But both American baseball and English rounders, regardless, were played on a diamond, as you can see by the little illustration here. It looks too algebraic for my taste, but that's okay. Um, both, uh, both sports were played on, on a diamond with posts or stones placed between 12 and 20 yards apart with a leather covered ball. Uh, usually of yarn wrapped around a bit of cork or a, or a musket ball or any convenient thing as a core, relatively round rock, I guess, would do. Often the bases were not equidistant markers, but again, back to, that, back to my misspent youth in the 1960s, but random rocks and shrubs and other features of the field that were more or less convenient. Two leaders chose up sides, but unlike modern baseball, there were no set numbers of players. Um, nor was there regular fielding positions besides someone to feed the ball to the, to the batter and someone to catch. A player spit on one side of the paddle that was used to hit the ball, since how often do kids have coins, especially in the early 1800s. Um, and so they, they'd spit on the paddle used to hit the ball, and then leaders from each team called wet or dry, like heads or tails. And uh, the ball was tossed up, and the, oh, the bat was tossed up and the side that it correctly picked wet or dry would land, how it would land would decide which team had first innings. Um, as they described, the feeder tossed the ball gently to each batter in turn. If the batter missed the ball three times, sound familiar, or hit it behind the catcher, he was out. He could also be put out if a hit ball was caught. Now, some players allowed the ball to be caught on one bounce for an out, while others required it to be caught on the fly like in modern baseball. When a batter hit the ball, he ran the bases clockwise. That's one real common feature of early rules in children's books for baseball. They round the field clockwise, not counterclockwise as is done in baseball today. In other words, when you're standing at, at, at home plate, you, you run to your left, not to your right. Um, 
to what we would call third, they called first and what they called um, third, we call first, that kind of thing. But anyway, um, but he ran as far as he could. And then, and then uh, by 1839, one set of rules did call for this counterclockwise running of the bases like we do today. There were a lot of versions for children's games, but hitting a runner between bases with a thrown ball could also put him out. This technique was called soaking or plugging or burning the runner. Um, I guess you just threw it real hard. It was burning, <laughs> certainly burned if you got hit by a, a rapidly thrown ball. A tally, a run, was scored every time a runner crossed home. Each one of the players on the team that had that um, team at bat had to be put out before the fielding team that had its innings. They had to put everybody on the other team out um, before you could have your turn at bat. Presumably, the team with the highest score after each side had their turn at bat won. But they don't spell out who wins and loses, just say how to play, not how to win. Rounders, in turn, um, probably evolved from the game of old cat, which I've got up here now. Why You're wondering why I've got old cat. Um, let me talk about old cat, um, in which an old spindle or an oblong piece of wood, the cat, or later, or later a ball, was then pitched, then struck with a bat. So originally they're playing it with an odd hunk of wood, not just a not a not a not a ball. But one child um, threw, one child caught, and one child hit. So you only need three kids. You could have more. When the ball was hit, the batter would run to a given point and back before the feeder could get the ball and hit him with it. If if he was hit, he was out, and the thrower got the bat. If he beat the fielders, he scored a point and kept batting. When the batter missed the ball or a hit ball was caught, he was out and the catcher then got to bat. If there were more players, they played two old cat with two batters, two bases to run between, which must've been a lot more exciting. Um, both batters were compelled when one of the two got a hit and either could then be put out. Six boys could play three old cat with three bats and three bases and fielders throwers standing between each. Eight or more boys could play four old cat. You get how this goes. Um, while four old cat was played with four bases like baseball, it's important to remember that it was a game of individuals. Old cat is not a deep game of teams. Every, it's every man, girl, boy for himself, an old cat. Um, but the game continued like it does today to evolve. And of course, another ball game that evolved very similar to it was cricket, which by the 1850s, by reading a lot of newspapers was probably as popular and probably more popular in the United States um, among adult males, uh, amateurs, but adult males nonetheless, as baseball was. But anyhow, um, my point here though, is for many centuries, ball was a game that was played rather than a sport that was watched. In other words, it, it was for the players, not for spectators. By the 19th century, it became recreation for grown men in addition to what it had long been plays play for boys and girls. Baseball grew as America grew. And since ball playing was a child of commercial towns and cities, not isolated family farms so that you could have a concentration of people because without at least a modest concentration of population, team sports were nigh well impossible, hence old cat. Consequently, um, oh, excuse me, conversely, um, as more Americans left farms for commercial and industrial employment, the diversions of bucolic life grew equally difficult to pursue, things like uh, hunting and horseback riding. It's hard to do in the middle of Manhattan. Um, and baseball provided a pleasant diversion from the pressures of urban life. All you needed was an empty field or empty lot. As center villages developed in America's country towns in the early 18, 1800s, so did baseball gain in popularity there as well. So codification of rules beyond simple instructions in children's books, like I've illustrated so far, came along when the game was avidly adapted by grown men instead of boys and girls. With increasing urbanization and leisure time in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, and beyond, some adult men in the expanding merchant and professional class uh, in search of recreation and innocent conviviality began to organize teams to play the games of their youth. Like I said, cricket was initially the dominant organized sport of urban American men in the 1800s. If published rules and newspaper reports of matches are any indi indi indication of that, 
baseball, which um, even when played by the unskilled, could produce, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what was I saying? Um, oh, baseball, you know, even when you're unskilled, could produce exciting matches. And it came to dominate probably by the 1850s or 1860. However, the slow pace of cricket um, and a growing nativist distaste for this obviously English import led to it fading from the American sports scene, or at least largely so. Uh, this healthy and relatively harmless play served as relief from pressures for urban and increasingly commercial lives. By the 1850s, these social ball clubs, as they were called, could be found in most cities and many larger towns. As the caliber of play improved and the game itself became more complicated and exciting, baseball attracted spectators as well as players. In the 1850s, newspapers often reported on games, both reflecting a growing general interest in the game and further encouraging the interest. The first admission charge to a baseball game came in 1858 when fans paid 50 cents each to watch a game between the all-star teams from Brooklyn and New York City play at the fashion race course on Long Island. Remember, early on, Brooklyn was not one of the five boroughs of New York City. It was a separate city itself over on the um, western end of Long Island. Uh, ostensibly, by the way, that fee that they paid to go to that baseball game was to put the field in grandstands in, in a shape that could accommodate a large crowd of people since the race course had fallen on hard times. Anyway, betting on baseball matches became common by the late 1850s, along with the potential for abuses that that entails. In other words, the fixing of games um, long before the Black Sox scandal or, um, uh, or uh, Pete Rose ever were born. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, soldiers on both sides played a lot of baseball between battles, further spreading knowledge of the game. And by the 1860s, the great game had grown so popular and because of spectator fees and bad betting, it became potentially profitable that some players were actually paid to join teams, what we would call ringers today. And professional baseball was thus born. The sport and the business have grown steadily together since and battled some of the same demons ever since. So let's talk a little bit more about some of these, um, these early uh, games that evolved into professional baseball in the 1860s. Um, and as I said, you really need that urban concentration for people to play, even when you've got the children's game evolving into an adult game. And of course, we still play it with, um, with our visitor children to Old Sturbridge Village, and we have where I work, and, um, and we have uh, um, kind of a day camp called uh, Discovery Adventures, and the kids play games too, including the early version of baseball. The hardest thing is to, to get the kids to remember to run to their left because modern kids know modern baseball and they want to run to their right. Anyhow, regardless of that, um, town ball. Let me talk about town ball. Um, the game of town ball was not a nationally accepted sport in the mid-19th century. Um, and the game that we now know as baseball had a number of regional variations. In Philadelphia and its environs of uh, the mid-Atlantic states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they played a game much like rounders, but they usually called it town ball. As early as 1831, Philadelphia was home to a town ball club called the Olympics. And there must have been other clubs because they had to play somebody. They couldn't just um, divide up and play themselves all the time. The game was played on a square field instead of a diamond. And the striker, what we'd call a batter, stood in front of a four foot square between first and fourth base. So it's a square with, um, with a, the, the batter's box, as we'd call it, the striker's box, uh, between the first and the last base. Um, except for the batter's square, the, the bases were 40 feet apart and teams varied from between 10 and 20 players. Runners could be put out by soaking, um, in other words, hitting him with a ball, or if a hit ball was caught on the fly or on only one bounce and only one out retired aside. So unlike the earlier version where you had to get everybody out on the other team, this one, one person's out, time to change sides. Must have been an awful lot of running back and forth to the field um, with one out on a side. They enjoyed intramural play, as I mentioned, and on occasion they issued and accepted challenge matches from nearby rivals. 
when the Philadelphia team crossed the Delaware to play a team from Camden, New Jersey in 1831, not enough players could be fielded for a game of town ball. So instead, they played a game of two old cat instead. You come out for playing, you can't play baseball, we may as well play something. Unlike modern Sandlot teams, uh, Sandlot teams, the Olympic Baseball Club, like others to follow in New York, Boston, and other towns and cities, was primarily a rather exclusive social club. The players were not from all walks of life. There were no street toughs or even tradesmen on their teams, but almost solely, quote, gentlemen, in other words, professionals, store clerks, merchants. Members participated for the sake of convivial recreation, respectable exercise, and, um, and polite social intercourse rather than a th burning thirst for, for competition. Uh, theirs was not a game of diving catches, foul language, brawling, or sliding into bases, cleats first. Their genteel challenge matches were usually followed by a banquet hosted by the challengers. Players were often expected to make flowery speeches at these banquets and exercise their oratorical skills. It was customary for the winners to receive the game ball or sometimes a bat used in the game as a trophy of their victory. I guess kind of like the, the matador gets two ears and a tail, um, you know, for if he does a particularly good bullfight. Anyway, on to, uh, on to another city. I think there we go. And that city is New York. And while the Olympics were the first known uh, town ball team in Philadelphia, one of the first ones, if not the first one in New York, was the Knickerbockers, um, from Washington Irving's uh, phrase for New Yorkers, the Knickerbockers. He wrote, I think, in 1808, the Knickerbocker history of New York. Anyway, an early name for the team. Now, of course, it's a, a basketball team, the Knickerbockers, the Knicks. Um, they don't use the big names anymore. The Mets, they used to be the Metropolitans in an earlier incarnation. But when they were refranchised in what, 1962, I believe, they just shortened it to Mets. So same thing with the Knickerbockers, just Knicks. That was basketball. But anyway, modern baseball was indeed born in New York, I think, um, or at least what we'd recognize more as baseball. And many historians kind of agree with that. I say kind of. Um, the, the, the classic story, which I won't spend as much time debunking as um, I will uh, in a little while, um, the, the great Abner Doubleday um, goes that, uh, that a 25-year-old bank clerk and volunteer fireman named Alexander Cart Cartwright organized a team called the Knickerbockers Baseball Club in New York City in 1845. Well, you know, Cartwright was involved and he was probably a member, but he didn't single-handedly invent baseball. Um, since 1842, Cartwright and some buddies had been meeting informally on a field on 27th Street and 4th Avenue in, in Manhattan to play baseball. Um, in the spring of 1845, Cartwright, along with uh, a guy named Duncan Curry and uh, E.R. Um, Dubinac Jr., William Tucker, William Wheaton, uh, maybe some others, started to recruit friends as members for an organized club that became the Knickerbockers. Um, this, this idea of formal organization was a mania among Americans throughout the uh, antebellum period. <laughs> some foreigner, I forget it was Alexis de Tocqueville or or an Englishman are observed that you get three Americans together in the early 1800s. They immediately write a constitution, elect one of the three president, another vice president, the other guy gets to be secretary treasurer. Americans just love to, to organize clubs and what they call voluntary associations, either for recreation like this or social reform. Anyway, again, I digress, sorry. Um, by September 23rd of 1845, the limit of 40 members was reached for the Knickerbockers Club and the first set of officers was elected with Curry elected president, Wheaton as vice president and Tucker as secretary treasurer. Well, where was Cartwright? Well, exactly, if Cartwright was disinvolved, um, he was involved, but as later I'll tell you with Doubleday, so were a lot of people over a lot of years. History is written by the victors, at least by the literary survivors. Um, so like Cartwright, who often inflate their own roles in successful events and diminish them, this is Cartwright, both young in life and older in life. And that's a trumpet as a volunteer fireman, um, which I also mentioned he was. Um, since it's loud, it fires. Somebody needs to make a phone to shout. Anyway, um, history is written by the victors. So uh, 
people like Cartwright often inflate their own roles in events, diminish the roles of other people um, when things do not turn out as well as they want. Um, yeah, I guess I was there, but you know, I wasn't all that involved if it doesn't turn out well. And I was pretty young and I didn't mean it. I'm really sorry. I shouldn't behave that way. Anyway, you know how that goes. Anyway, like the Olympics, the Knickerbockers were a selective social club with a $5 annual dues, an initiation fee of $2 and fines for profanity, fines for arguing a call and fines for other crude behavior. Now the, the requirement of truthfully pretty steep dues and fees and social connections and enough leisure time to spend every Monday and Thursday um, during the baseball season, not at work, but at play, are indicators of rather privileged status of club members. I mean, a guy spending 12 hours out in the hot sun mowing hay would get a dollar. So a $5 annual a fee, an initiation fee of a couple days pay, this is, this is not a game for people that are really doing uh, physical work for a living who wouldn't have the energy to do it anyway, I dare say. Anyway, in October, they divided into teams among themselves and began playing on the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey. The five acre tracks surrounded on three sides by woods and fronting on the Hudson River, along with dressing rooms uh, was rented for $75 a year, which is why they needed those $5 membership fees. Um, what might be called the first baseball game between two competing baseball teams as opposed to town ball, was played on June of 1846 when the Knickerbockers played the New York Nine at Hoboken. The, the Nine, by the way, were composed of original Knickerbockers who disagreed with this idea of traveling to New Jersey to play and instead liked to stay at Murray Hill in Manhattan to play instead of crossing the river to go to New Jersey um, twice a week. So they agreed that 21 aces, in other words, runs, would constitute a win after each side had an equal number of times at bat, not the same number of innings, but after four innings at that first game, with Cartwright himself, not as a player, but as umpire, the New York Nine won by a score of 23 to one. So much for the Knickerbockers. The Cartwright story probably contains as much legend as I mentioned as myth or historical fact. Um, it's probably just a convenient simplification to lay as much on one man's shoulders as, as possible. However, people like to hear single hero stories as um, I'll, oh, computer's frozen up again, I'm sorry. Come on computer. Ooh. There we go. So um, the codification of rules, many of which remain today is what earned the Knickerbockers their place as the fathers of modern baseball in a lot of people's minds. If not Cartwright, then the Knickerbockers at least in a large part. Among the innovations that were um, introduced and I think more importantly codified by the Knickerbockers was the, um, the, the idea of um, nine players on a side. They didn't always have nine players. Sometimes they had more, sometimes they had less, but eventually they settled on nine people uh, on, a, on a team. Um, and uh, that, that uh, but among their other uh, rules that they introduced was the, the less brutal idea of tagging a runner between bases instead of soaking him with a thrown ball. Um, by their fourth meeting in 1848, because pretty much every year they revised their rules, they decided to allow merely tagging a base to put out a runner. You didn't even have to touch the guy with the ball, just touch the base, again, like modern baseball. The ball they used was about the size and about the weight of a modern baseball with an India rubber core wrapped with yarn and covered with leather kind of like a modern baseball. Also, unlike the modern game, they use canvas bags as bases, not those posts or sticks, and they set them 90 feet apart, as we do today. Unlike earlier versions, with the Knickerbockers, nine men made up a team, as I said, eventually. Fielders were also uh, began to play set positions, um, and they also would bat in an established order, and it took three outs to retire a side each inning. So batted balls were only fairly in play if hit between first and third bases. In other words, most of the field was foul territory um, and runners ran the bases counterclockwise as we do today. Uh, initially, the first team to score 21 aces, as I mentioned earlier, um, or, or runs won the game. But by January 1857, they changed this to the best score in seven innings and shortly thereafter in the best score in nine innings. Um, in 1849, they also adopted what may have been the first baseball uniform when they uh, 
stipulated um, white flannel shirts, blue woolen pantaloons, and straw hats. In 1851, the hats were replaced by mohair caps, the first baseball caps officially. The codification and proliferation of their rules, at least as much as the rules themselves, were what made the Knickerbockers such important con contributors to the game. By the 1850s, their idea of having published rules were imitated by other clubs, which copied their rules and their constitution. Their teams, these other teams in Greater New York include the Gothams, the Social Baseball Club, the Eagles, the Empires, the Eclectics, the Charter Oaks, the Independents, um, and uh, in, in the separate city of Brooklyn, you had the Atlantics, the Eckfords, the Putnams, the Excelsiors, among other teams. Um, some of these new teams were composed of working men, not always the social elites as before, so it became a more egalitarian game. These less exclusive clubs were often organized by occupation, such as the policemen who played as the Manhattans, the barkeeping phantoms, and the Metropolitans, all of whom were school teachers. Imitators not only arose across New York State, but by 1857 in Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, you find organized teams playing by New York rules, as they said. The California Eagles used New York rules on the West Coast by 1859. In March of 1858, in a meeting called by the Knickerbockers teams from the New York area forum, the National Association of Baseball Players, to further decide on rules and regulation. Greater New York had about 50 senior and 60 junior teams by 1860. I think that would qualify it as kind of the center of the baseball universe at the time at the, of the beginning of the Civil War. Some of the Knickerbockers rules, though, have not survived in modern baseball. Um, pitching was not nearly as critical to their game as it is today. The pitcher had to, quote, gently toss the ball underhand wherever the batter requested it. And he stood only 45 feet from home pl plate. It's not until 1858 that a man named James Crichton introduced the hard to hit pitch with a fast rising underhand toss, kind of like um, women's softball today. No gloves or other protective equipment were used by these early players. And so the catcher often stood 30 feet from home plate, um, not crouched immediately behind it. The Knickerbockers used cast iron discs painted white for both home plate and the pitcher's mound. Um, foul balls were caught on a bounce um, and that still put out the, the, the batter. In 1857, they outlawed catching balls in their caps or hats. And in 1859, refreshments were banned from the field. Um, luckily, that was changed by the time, time Babe Ruth um, was playing the game, at least for the beer and hot dog loving Babe. Um, so anyway, um, many, many, people had gone over to the, uh, and, and especially in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, had gone over to the faster paced um, New York uh, rules by the, uh, by the 1830s. Anyway, the, I lost my, my place here. I apologize. Let's see. Ah, let's talk about Massachusetts baseball. There we go. I'm, I'm figured out where I am now. Um, sorry about that. Um, the sport, at least as played by adults, evolved differently in New England than it did in New York and was played by a different set of rules than those adopted in New York. The game resembled town ball, but wasn't town ball. And by the 1850s, this variation was called the Massachusetts game or New England baseball. In Boston, the first organized ball club was the Olympics in 1854. Others followed, including the Elm Trees in 1855, the Green Mountains in 1857. There was even a junior club called the Hancocks. More teams soon followed in neighboring communities around greater Boston. The game grew so popular that in June of 1857, 2,000 spectators came to watch a best of three games match between the Olympics and the Sharon Wasapog Ball Club. They agreed to play with teams of 12, with the first team to reach 25 aces winning the game. By the way, the Sharon team won, but were in turn defeated later by the Midway Unions. In May 13, 1858, delegates from 10 teams in the greater Boston area met in Dedham to form the Massachusetts Association of Baseball Players. 
actually only nine teams formed the association. B of Gould and his Boston Tri Mountains preferred to play the, by the New York rules, and they withdrew from the meeting as a result of this. Um, that's one thing I should mention. These these geographic boundaries are not absolute. You had plenty of baseball teams in New York playing Massachusetts rules. You had plenty of teams in Massachusetts playing New York rules. People made up their own rules. It, it's still very amorphous. Um, but the, uh, the socially exclusive group that met codified the rules of their unique Massachusetts game. And, um, and they officially adopt the rules that were originally written by a ball club that called themselves the Take a Wombat Club. Um, clubs could feel equal numbers of between 10 and 14 players. So it didn't matter how many, as long as both teams were the same size. Like town ball, Massachusetts was played on a square field. In this case, as you can see, with the batter standing in a circle, 25 feet from the first base, but 35 feet from the, um, the fourth base. Um, he held a round bat less than two and a half inches in diameter. So a pretty, pretty small bat, um, pretty skinny bat. Um, but it could be any length he liked. And the ball used was a little bit smaller and much lighter than a modern baseball. More yarn, I guess, not as tightly wound. The thrower stood only 35 feet from the batter and was enjoined to deliver the ball wherever the batter wanted it. And it was not to be, quote, pitched or tossed. I guess that means you just throw it gently where he wants it. Thus, the ball was delivered overhand in Massachusetts baseball, not underhand as originally in New York baseball. The bases themselves were not canvas bags, but wooden posts four feet tall, much in like in that um, 1744 illustration of the, the boys in England playing. And they were 60 feet apart. Three strikes still made an out, but it took only one out to retire a side. Any ball was fair and in play, no matter where it was. There was no foul territory. But any hit ball that was caught was an out, including foul tips. Like town ball, runners could be soaked or burned with a thrown ball between bases. Each team chose a referee, and these in turn chose a third referee, preferably a member of another team um, in the association. The first team to score 100 runs was the winner. This led to a day to day long games, and a championship game in 1859 took a day and a half and 101 innings to complete. If you got to get to 100 runs and one out retires a side, you can just imagine why it could go so long. As a result, some teams instead agreed to play to only 21 or 25 tallies. Baseball was played in 1850s in Massachusetts, had some rather brutal features. That idea of throwing the ball to burn the runner. Another as dangerous feature, Massachusetts baseball, was the strategy known as backstriking. Now, this is a result of no foul territory. Since any hit ball was fair and in play, the reasoning was that there were thir up to 13 fielders in front of you as the batter, but there's only one guy behind you, and he's often 30 feet back. So some batters intentionally tried to hit the ball back towards the catcher. The hitter either hoped to force the catcher to run for the ball or hoped to injure the unprotected catcher with a hit ball so that he could get on base. Like I said, some brutal rules. Um, playing without gloves, a requirement that hit balls had to be caught on the fly and not on the bounce, must have also generated a little pain now and then um, and stinging of the hands. While Massachusetts baseball was in many ways closer to the old English game of rounders or simple town ball than modern baseball, it did contribute to a few more innovations to the game of baseball as we know it today. Massachusetts baseball introduced called strikes when a batter repeatedly refused to swing at good pitches. Hit balls did have to be caught on the fly and not on the bounce um, for the batter to be out. Also, like the game today, if the catcher dropped the ball on the third strike, the ball was considered still in play and the batter was obliged to run as if he had made a hit. Massachusetts baseball did not evolve in a vacuum, however. As I said, Boston and New York had too many personal and commercial ties for that. The New York rules had already spread to New England before the rules for Massachusetts baseball were ever officially written down. In 1857, watch case maker Edward G. Saltzman of New York Gotham's moved to Boston and joined the Boston Tri Mountains. The team was named, of course, after the three original hills of Boston, which have been cut down and I think made into the Back Bay. Um, since his teams began to play by New York rules, 
Uh, as previously mentioned, this had caused the Tri Mountains to leave the convention of Massachusetts baseball players in 1858. That same year, they played the Portland Maine Club on Boston Common using New York rules. 59 New England teams played Massachusetts baseball by 1860, but 18 teams in the Bay State um, played uh, by the less brutal and faster paced New York rules. Even the Philadelphia Olympics Town Ball Club gave up town ball and began to play by New York baseball rules by 1860. So baseball was not restricted to the East Coast. Um, it spread uh, to the all across the Eastern seaboard. It spread with the restless population West. It was played wherever New Yorkers and New Englanders settled from Detroit and Cleveland, the larger part, the large Southern city of New Orleans was a particular center for baseball playing in the South, and baseball was as popular in several, several Southern schools as it was at Northern schools. By the middle of the 19th century, many American clergy promoted baseball and like exercise, or what was called at the time muscular Christianity, as good for both body and soul. Other Americans, however, failed to warm to the game. While the game was played in the South, many Southerners failed to embrace baseball, with the same enthusiasm as their northern brethren. This was particularly uh, due to the more rural nature in the south, in addition to planters love of hunting and horse racing and other such, quote, genteel sports. Thomas Jefferson wrote his nephew Peter Carr, quote, games played with a ball and others of that nature are too violent for the body and stamp no character on the mind. Likewise, some religious groups such as Quakers condemned play in general and ball playing in particular is frivolous and imp impious. In contrast, as I mentioned, the Puritan fathers actively encouraged it as preferable to gambling. Why did baseball as played in New York survive and grow while town ball and Massachusetts baseball disappeared? Um, perhaps New York rules made for a better balance of individual achievement and team play by confining fairly hit balls to that 90 degrees between first and third bases, New York baseball is not only easier and safer to play, but also much more congenial to spectators. Since, since you, you, have, you don't have the runner, the, the players going all over the field trying to, trying to play balls, including into the spectators areas. By banning back striking, overhand pitching, and soaking the runner, New York baseball was less dangerous to play than the Massachusetts version. It was also a little simpler and easier um, to, to, to learn than Massachusetts baseball. Now, although each side uh, three outs per inning was made for base runners and thus it made for more exciting action filled game than one at one out retires the side like in Massachusetts ball. The livelier ball in New York also made for longer hits by limiting the, 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 the game to the first 21 uh, aces and limiting it to nine innings instead of 100 runs games were much shorter and enjoyable. Finally, the success of New York style of baseball may owe in part to New York's urban imperialism, um, which continues today. Um, the idea that you know, New York is still a culturally dominant um, city. Throughout the 19th century, New York dramatically grew in size as well as commercial and um, cultural dominance. And frankly, Boston and Philadelphia declined in relative terms to New York in the 1800s. In 1860, the, uh, the Brooklyn Excelsior toured throughout New York State by train, playing local clubs and further spreading the influence of New York baseball. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, why is my computer being cranky? Sorry for this, folks. Why the slides are not advancing. There we go, they're advancing too fast. Okay, so what about Abner Doubleday? I know I've been keeping you hanging on uh, tenter hooks. Um, in 1885, excuse me, 1888, um, Albert G. Spaulding, founder of the Sporting Goods Empire that bears his name, took his own Chicago baseball club and team and a team of National League All-Stars on a promotional world tour, playing exhibition games from Australia to Hawaii to Egypt. When they returned to the States in 1889, a banquet was held in their honor at New York's Delmonico restaurant. Filled with American pride, the president of the National League declared to the assembled guests, including novelist Samuel Langhorne Clemens, in other words, Mark Twain, that baseball was an, a Yankee game and not descended from English rounders, a sentiment heartily echoed by the patriotic crowd. 
but this did not settle the issue of what were the origins of baseball. And increasingly people wanted to know. In 1805, a blue ribbon commission was appointed by the president of the National League to decide on the origins of the game. And the chairman, uh, the, uh, the National League president, A.G. Mills and uh, Annie Young and George White and James Sullivan and Alfred J. Reach and U.S. Senators Arthur Gorham and Morgan Buckley were appointed on this Mills Commission. Um, and the Mills Commission set out to decide once and for all the true origins of the game of baseball. This distinguished body did not examine any documentary evidence, including the stuff I read exhaustively at you half an hour ago. Instead, they interviewed several people. They rejected um, the man who really wrote the first rule book of baseball in 1858. Henry Chadwick, because he was English, even though he was a popular American sports writer, lived here, he was born in England, and he told the truth that baseball evolved from rounders, um, and they didn't want to hear that. And so um, they rejected him. He's now in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but posthumously. Um, they, in 1907, they declared that Abner Doubleday invented the game. Why did they do that? They wanted to name one man. Now we all know Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, right? Well, kind of, he had help. He did it with all these guys in a laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And we all know he invented the phonograph and a lot of other things, right? He expanded to a much larger laboratory, which is now a national park in East Orange, New in West Orange, New Jersey. This is all the Jefferson, uh, the, Jefferson the uh, Edison laboratory where he invented the phonograph, he and about a hundred other people. Um, but, you know, like Elon Musk and the rockets and yeah, he invented it because he was the, the force behind it. Uh, in 1807, this, um, this commission based on the testimony of this man, Abner Graves, uh, engineer in Colorado, um, who supposedly remembered based on his memory many years before he declared that the late Civil War hero Abner Doubleday had invented baseball by writing out the rules for a game in 1839 between the Otsego Academy and Green Select School in Cooperstown. The story goes that these two teams showed up, didn't know what to do. Doubleday shows up, maybe on a cloud, I don't know, and wrote rules and gave them to him. Not only did the commission ignore the many published references to baseball going back more than a century before 1839, and any conflicting testimony they heard, and they heard plenty, but they forgot the fact that Abner Doubleday was an army cadet at West Point in 1839, and he wasn't in Cooperstown, and he wasn't allowed to take leave because he was an underclassman. So he was not, you can prove, he was not in Cooperstown, even though he was from there in 1839. Abner Doubleday himself never, ever once claimed to have invented baseball. He made no mention of ball playing when recalling his own childhood. He remembered that he liked art, he liked poetry, he liked mathematics, he liked map making. Nothing about baseball or any game with balls. No mention was made of baseballs in Dubner's in Doubleday's extensive 1893 obituary in the New York Times. No copy of Doubleday's alleged rules survives, nor were they ever published. The Doubleday myth of 1907 gained little widespread popularity, however until a little later. Um, by the way, Abner Doubleday does have one link to baseball. I will admit that. In 1871 and 72, Doubleday commanded the 24th Infantry, an African-American regiment headquartered in Texas. And what he did was in a letter, he mentioned to a friend that he was gonna order baseballs and bats for the amusement of the garrison. So his soldiers would play baseball instead of drinking and gambling and doing other things that since the Puritans, they recommended baseball was better than. Now, Doubleday did invent stuff. He did the patent, the San Francisco cable car, the basic thing is used today. He did fire the first shot in the Civil War. He was second in command at Fort Sumter in 1861 under Major Robert Anderson. And when the Confederates started firing on him and they finally decided, okay, we're gonna shoot back, he led his second in command, Emder Doubleday, fire the first cannon. So he sh uh, fired the first Union shot in the Civil War. Beyond that, though, I like this. Branch Rickey, the great late American sports writer, said the only thing Abner Doubleday ever started was the Civil War. So 
But the Wells Commission wanted to pin it on somebody. So they pinned it on Doubleday. Hooray for Doubleday. How did this fact, if you will, grow? It's because at the height of the Great Depression in the 1930s, the sleepy little town of Cooperstown, New York was desperate for money. And they figured tourist dollars would be how they'd get their money. And so some people remembered, hey, remember back in 1907, 30 some odd years ago, somebody said in 1839, Abner Doubleday invented baseball. Why don't we build a, ball, a, a, a hall of fame? If we build it, they will come. I made that up from the movie, um, Field of Dreams. But nonetheless, that's what they did and say it. And uh, based on this, that's why the Hall of Fame's in Cooperstown. Now the Hall of Fame admits that this Abner Doubleday thing is a myth. Didn't stop him from naming the baseball field at Cooperstown um, Doubleday Field, but it didn't stop him from having the Hall of Fame there. So it was all about the money. Um, now there is that other thing about Cartwright and the New York Knickerbockers. So they finally decided to posthumously elect Cartwright to the Baseball Hall of Fame, call him the father of modern baseball, and um, put him in the Hall of Fame, but leave out most of the influence of the under Knickerbockers and just say, you know, that he organized the baseball club and carried baseball to Pacific because he did move to Hawaii for a while. Anyway, um, so even though the Knickerbockers get short shrift by the Hall of Fame, um, by the 1860s, as I mentioned, Baseball had become a professional game because there was money to be made. Um, and that's why the myths of these great inventors of baseball, Doubleday and Cartwright, continue because of the money to be made. Now, there's a revival, of course. Yeah, modern Major League Baseball has a revenue, at least in 2019, of almost $11 billion. Um, and when there's money involved, it's hard to be a strictly accurate historian. Um, but there are history enthusiasts who like to play by the old rules. And there's a number of teams throughout the uh, United States today that uh, get together and, uh, and play by 1860s rules, 1880s rules, 1850s rules, um, and reproduce old uniforms and enjoy playing the game. But I've kept you all long enough, so I'll end there and, um, stop my share and, uh, Again, thank you all for your attention and your patience while I nattered on about rounders and Abner Doubleday and all the rest. So back to you, Patrick. Um, well, th thank you very much. Um, if there's anyone that has any, any questions, if we have time for a few questions, Tom, is that, is that all right? Sure. I probably won't know the answer, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> uh, if, if anyone would like to, um, you can uh, use your uh, reaction to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask her a question or write it in the chat and I'll be able to uh, let uh, bring it over to Tom. Do, do. Mm -hmm. well, nothing in the chat at the moment. Oh, Betsy has a question. So the red stockings, the precursor to the Red Sox? Yes, yes, they are. Yep. I find it wonderfully ironic that the, um, it's just a kill time since nobody else is asking questions, uh, <laughs> that, um, that uh, the, the, the evil empire, if you will, um, I know um, that uh, um, you know, Longmeadow is approaching uh, the, the sort of gray zone between the uh, Red Sox nation and the, the Yankees. Um, but I find it ironic that uh, the, the Bronx Bombers are called the, uh, the New York Yankees because Yankee was originally a New York pejorative for New Englanders. Um, oh. they, uh, it, it comes from, um, in, in, in early America, a country bumpkin, a rube, uh, a goober, a gomer, pick the pejorative you want, was called a Jonathan. And what's worse than calling somebody a Jonathan? Call him Johnny, a little Jonathan, a boy, not even an adult man. Um, and so the, uh, the, the, the Dutch in New Amsterdam evolved to New York, um, uh, started calling Yankees, especially people from Connecticut who go into New York City to sell their cheese and, and buy supplies and whatever else, um, would, would joke in, in Dutch and say, ah, Yanni, Yanni, which is Dutch for Johnny, uh, you know, and that the English ears heard Yanni as Yankee. And that's where Yankee comes from. Um, they, they, they had other 
um, inventive etymologies in the 19th century, but the current etymology is that's where the word Yankee comes from. And of course, there's that old joke that uh, to, a, to a foreigner, any American's a Yankee, to uh, an American, any Northerner is a Yankee, to a Northerner, any New Englander is a Yankee, to a New Englander, a Mainer is a Yankee, and to a Mainer, somebody who eats pie for breakfast is a Yankee. So that's my <laughs> dissertation on Yankees. Babe Ruth, Derek Jeter, everyone aside, you know, forgive me. <laughs> I never bought into the curse of the Bambino, by the way. Yes, while the Red Sox um, sold um, Babe Ruth um, to the Yankees um, for 30, 20 pieces of silver. I made that part up. Um, <laughs> um, um, Ruth, Ruth did end his career in Boston, granted with the Boston Braves, which became the Atlanta Braves. And so you had two lifetime home run records set by Braves players. Babe Ruth, and then Hank Aaron. Different cities, but the same team, the Braves. Oh, was that anyway. Common? Oh, sorry. I'm was sorry? That for, was that common for teams to move from like Boston, like the Boston Braves? Oh, yeah. Like oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, more recently, um, teams have moved around on the West Coast a lot. You, do, you see it with baseball all the time. Or football, I should say. You know, the football teams are, some of them are, are you know, they're, they're in a different city every five years, it seems, especially the Western teams. Um, you know, the Rams have been bouncing back and forth and around. And of course, uh, and you know, the Colts used to, when I was a kid, the, the, the Colts played in Baltimore, not in Indianapolis. And, uh, but yeah, no, but teams, teams move. I mean, the famous, the great betrayal was when the Brooklyn Dodgers moved to Los Angeles. And uh, some people have never, never gotten over that. Well, most of them are dead now, but <laughs> the people that are still alive that remember that have never gotten <laughs> over the, the, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, abandoning um, New York for uh, for Los Angeles. So, uh, yeah, we had one we had one person say that there there is a vintage baseball team in Westfield known as the Wheelers. That we have one team uh, in 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 the local area. Yeah. So that's yeah. That's there's awesome. team, some uh, some of them some of them in some places are associated with museums. I know that um, I used to uh, uh, work part time at a living history village on Long Island called Old Bethpage Village. And they've for decades had a very avid, two different, two different uh, early baseball leagues. Um, and, uh, and during the last major league baseball strike, um, they, they, they were very popular because they were the only game on uh, in greater New York um, with the Mets and the Yankees, uh, you know, on strike. So anyway, but yeah, there's, there, there, there are a number of uh, local, um, at least there's one you know area uh team and these these teams move all over uh mostly in the east coast in the midwest um they're they're particularly popular but they're all over uh we have one question here i'm gonna have them unmute uh trudy go ahead oh hi uh less less a, a question than a, a comment uh it's this terrific presentation and it just um it, it's just amazing how, you know, we're given a history with a spotlight that stops at a certain point or shows a certain player featured. Um, yep. And then when you get someone who does like you did, which is go into the expanded, <laughs> you know, story, uh, it's just amazing. So I love the illustrations also. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we like simple explanations. I mean, you folks have been very patient, but most people, I don't think would have waited for over an hour to learn about Abner Doubleday in baseball. I, God bless you guys for being so patient, but you know, most people just want to, okay, did he invent it or not? Yes, no, done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who invented baseball? Abner Doubleday, two words, done. Okay, that's the answer. Well, it evolved over time in, in different countries and different names. And it was played this way in New England and that way in New York and this way in Pennsylvania. And they sort of combined. And then with people from all over got together during the Civil War and homogenized further and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's enough, Tom. Be quiet now. So <laughs> Abner Doubleday, done. Uh, we have another question. When did they start using gloves? Like um, normally? Once, once they go professional, um, I don't, I don't know. I want to say that that by the, I think it's the 1860s, 70s, one or two guys start using gloves, and certainly by the 20th century, it becomes much more common. Um, but I, exactly when I forget, I, I read it once somewhere, but I'm sorry. This always happens at this thing. Um, at whenever I do this talk, we always get these things that are past my 
uh, limited um, span of knowledge. You know, people ask who who led the league in stolen bases in 1947. It's like, ah, oh. so. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a good question. I just don't remember the exact answer. I want to say it evolved in the 1860s to the 1880s, but I don't remember. Yeah. The question continues. Was that the same with the, with the, with the, when was the baseball standardized, like the construction of it, or does that depend again? No, that was one thing that the, um, in general terms that the Knickerbockers were doing by the 1850s was, you know, getting a little more, and we've gotten in so many things so much more precise over exact, 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 as time goes by exactly how many pounds of air in the football, um, you know, inflate gate and everything else. Um, but, uh, but even in the 1850s, one of those things the New York Knickerbockers did was, you know, specify the, 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 the size and construction of the ball to try to, you know, get it more uniform instead of just whatever, you know, little thing you kind of sew together that's kind of round. And, and so, because again, they wanted to, because once, once, once adults get involved, then you start getting this, okay, real rules as opposed to, well, come on, let's go play. And well, there's not enough of us. Okay, we'll play old cat. Okay, we'll do this. Okay, you know, I'll just go back and forth and, you know, you catch the ball, then you get the bat, that kind of thing. So, so once adults get involved, all the fun goes, well, not all the fun goes out of it, but yeah, people, people could get start much, much fussier, you know? And, and again, and, and kids catch on to that. I mean, I can imagine that again, I, I remember as a kid, you know, arguing about rules once you've, you've seen the way the adults play and now you've got strict rules and it's like, it's the gospel, you know, it's, it's, those are the rules, you know, no meat on Friday, whatever it is that becomes a, a you know, a religious dogma and doctrine. So. Okay. Does anyone else have any, any questions or anything they want to put in the chat? Uh, I don't. I don't see any anything else. I mean, if if we're all uh, all set to go, then um, let me just again. Um, we hope you enjoyed uh, tonight's uh, program, uh, which was brought to you in conjunction with the Longmeadow Historical Society. Um, uh, Betsy, Al, please wave. Let everyone know you're <laughs> there. You are. Um, and uh, this program is supported by a grant from the Longmeadow Cultural Council, a local agency which is supported by the Mass Cultural Council, Council a state agency. So we want to thank them for, for, their, for their support and uh, the, the Historical Society as well. So thank you so much, Tom, for, for, for your wonderful presentation. We love having you. Um, thank the, you so much. The, the second time we've had you here and you, you always do a great job. So Kind of you. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Take care, everybody.